part of the GS requirement, GS majors must conduct a faculty mentored research project, write a thesis, and publicly present their findings. So today's presenters will each be sharing their research results and also answering questions from the audience. Today's rules for our symposium, please keep your microphone muted at all times. Please hold all chat window comments until after each presentation has completed. Upon completion of the presentation, there will be a brief opportunity for everyone to unmute their microphones and collectively congratulate the speaker. After this brief congratulations, I will moderate questions and comments via the chat window or raised hand. So if you have a question, comment, please simply enter in the chat window or raise your hand and I will call on you and the speaker will then answer. All right, so uh, our first speaker today is Solomon Chen. Solomon will be speaking on the strategic monitoring and resilience training in the Alawai watershed, Oahu, seasonal and episodic variability, and his mentor is Brian Glazer. Solomon. Um, aloha everyone, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm Solomon Chen. For the past few years, I was fortunate to work with Dr. Brian Glazer on the strategic monitoring and resilience training small alibi project. Um, this project aims to construct a comprehensive sampling network using low-cost sensor technology and regular water quality survey and water sampling throughout a watershed, using the data to empower both academic research and education in and outside of the classroom. And before I start um, my presentation, I want to talk a little bit about um, the structure of my presentation. Um, you can see that little green bar um, below the title on each slide. Each of the bullet point on the green bar will tell you where I'm at in my presentation. So firstly, in introduction, I'll talk a little bit about the background of Alawai Canal and what we've done in terms of water quality survey and sampling during the sampling period of this project. After that, in the stream section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the interesting finding and characteristics of stream water quality. Um, after that, in canal section, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the general condition in the Alawai Canal. And after that, in the interaction section, hopefully this is where I will try my best to wrap it all up and paint a picture um, in terms of the nutrient fluxes and quantification of that, and hopefully give you an idea of general biogeochemical cycling processes within the watershed. And I have a lot of material, so just left dive right in. Um, so the Alawai Canal was constructed during um, 1921 and 1928. Uh, it connects the three major streams within the watershed, Makiki, Manoa, and Palolo streams. It also connects uh, numerous city and water drainage, so it's important for the function of downtown Honolulu. But it comes with some inherited problems. Um, firstly, we have the sediment accumulation problem, which leads to the need of dredging from time to time. And with that comes flood concern, and the flood concern goes hand in hand with the sea level rise concern and king, king die condition. And on top of those two, we have severe eutrophication primarily as a result um, of heavy urbanization. So um, what we've done during the sampling period is that uh, we have 12 stations throughout the watershed along three sh major streams. And we use sensor to take water quality parameters. And uh, we also take the street water sampling at all 12 sites. These sites are selected based on the existing USGS and water board management sites for references. Water samples were analysis and analyzed for nutrient data. And the same thing happens in um, the canal as well. Um, but this is where it got interesting because you can see a group of people driving a boat along Alawai Canal getting seriously sunburned trying to get that up. Um, we use high frequency profiling, um, high frequency sensor to do surface canal transect to get the surface water quality data. And then we use that on vertical canal profiling as well. The high frequency sensor technology allow us to produce a high um, spatial resolution snapshot of the water condition in the Alawai Canal. The street water samples are also taken at every other station in the canal for nutrient sample analysis. So after unloading all the information about what we've done over the past two years, um, here's some interesting characteristic in the streams and the interesting finding I want to share with you. Um, first, on this slide, you're looking at pH on your left-hand side and dissolve oxygen on your right-hand side, um, the distribution in stream water. 
And um, one interesting thing we noticed is that the highest pH occur at one side along Pololo stream. And that particular side also has the highest dissolved oxygen and highest temperature. Um, temperature plot is not shown here due to space and time. Um, but the takeaway here is that this site was the most well concretified, well channelized site comparing to the other sites throughout the watershed with more natural setting of a, a stream. And that gives us an idea of how um, urbanization and construction and land use change and um, basically the, the change of the stream and channelization can do to our water quality. And the other two parameter we look at, um, I wanna share with you is the uh, spatial distribution, the spatial gradient of total nitrogen concentration and total phosphorus concentration in the stream water. Um, on your left hand side is for total nitrogen and on the right side is for total phosphorus. And you may notice that um, they have opposite uh, spatial pattern. For the total nit nitrogen concentration, you see the highest concentration coming from the Palolo stream, which is on the east side of the watershed, and then the highest phosphorus concentration um, on the west side coming from Makiki stream. And this is quite interesting when you start to think about the spatial gradient and what's the difference in terms of the problem we have for stream water quality and maybe different type of a point or non-point source of pollution. And this also gets interesting when you start thinking about the quantification, the nutrient flux and nutrient transport into the canal. Uh, for example, in this case, um, an alloy watershed, Makiki stream is about responsible for about 10% of the freshwater input into the canal, while the Manoa Palolo stream combined provide the rest 90%. But the Makiki stream, while only is responsible for 10% of the freshwater input, with the higher total phosphorus concentration, it is contributing to about 25% of the total phosphorus load into the canal. And that, effect, that also affects the nutrient distribution and the concentration distribution within the canal water. So after talking about what happens in the stream, uh, I wanna share with you some of the general conditions we see on every sampling day in the Alawai Canal. So firstly, I'm showing you this color shaded salinity plot. It's a cross section of the canal water. Um, on the right hand, right end of the plot is the canal head and on the left end of the plot is the canal mouth and the two white dashed line represents the two major freshwater input into the canal. Um, so firstly, you look at this salinity plot, you can see that um, our canal is a well stratified water and mostly dominant by salinity. You see a really distinct freshwater layer, very shallow, about a foot deep. And then after that, it quickly transitioning into seawater um, salinity about 32 to 35. Um, and this, what this plot really is saying is that on normal day, Alawai can, Canal, the water in it is really not well mixed in terms of its uh, vertical gradient. And after that, we, after talking about vertical, poorly vertical mixing, uh, we can look at the horizontal or lateral mixing of the canal. And this temperature plot basically shows that um, it has a warmer water near the canal head and as you're progressing toward the canal mouth, you have cooler and cooler water from the ocean water influences. And that gradient, again, shows a poor lateral mixing in the canal, and mostly due to the sediment accumulation and shoaling, and also the bend in the canal. And after, look, after looking at the general mixing condition and mixing dynamic in the canal, we can uh, think about water quality parameters and where, um, these condition happens. Um, on the slides, I'm sharing with you the oxygen concentration. And the takeaway from this slide is that you can see a generally lower oxygen concentration pocket near the bottom water of the canal head. And that is always there. Um, it doesn't always go suboxic or anoxic, but it has the potential to do that. We have seen on some sampling day, it shows um, suboxic and anoxic condition near the water. Um, and then um, oxygen concentration actually goes hand in hand with higher chlorophyll concentration in the canal. Um, as you can see in this plot, we have um, fairly consistent chlorophyll concentration throughout the canal, 
but a higher chlorophyll concentration pocket near the bottom of the canal headwater. And we see occasional bloom of chlorophyll concentration, which could be result from a number of factors, including temperature, nutrient releases, and a mixing event. So after talking about the general condition and general mixing dynamic in the canal, I want to show you that uh, there are episodic forcing that can drive um, the canal mixing dynamic and therefore affect the maybe the biogeochemical processes within the canal. Um, there are two scenarios in our case. Um, one scenario is after rain event, that's when rain, wind, and excessive freshwater discharge provided the needed mechanical energy to break the stratification of the canal. Um, that is the data result on your left-hand side. And on your right-hand side is just the general canal water stratification I showed previously. And if you look at your left-hand side, you were probably thinking um, hypothetically, after a rain event, you should have more uh, fresh water on top. But in this case, our purple freshwater layer was not there. Um, it's a result from enhanced mixing. Think about it as you would when you're flushing a toilet, when you have excessive fresh water and rain to provide a mixing energy and allow that fresh water layer to make, mix with the bottom salt water layer. And again, this is reinforcing my point of episodic event. Um, this is the surface salinity plot for Alawai Canal after a rain event. And the, the takeaway from this plot is that the the Alawai Canal, the circulation pattern of it can divide the canal into two sections. One is from the canal head to the Manoa Palolo drainage. The other one is from Manoa Palolo drainage to the canal mouth. Um, as you can see, um, near the headwater, after rain event, you still have this sort of freshwater layer on top, while um, in the other section, it's more salt water. Uh, this really shows that these two sections of the canal had different response with excessive freshwater discharge and after rain event. And therefore, uh, when we're constructing conceptual model in the canal, it's important to think about um, different responses and circulation pattern due to the construction and design of the canal. And um, after talking about all the general conditions and a characteristic in the watershed, um, this is the ultimate goal for me to quantify nutrient fluxes. And to do that, we need to first do an estimation of water budget within Alawai Canal. Um, with the bathymetry data we collected and with the, inflow, with the inflow from USGS stations, taking precipitation and evaporation into account, we're able to estimate outflow and therefore um, come up with a estimated resistance time of water within the canal. That number has come out to be four days, about four days, which is fairly consistent with um, previous report and research. And with that, all that data in hand, we were able to um, we we're able to come up with the new system nutrient flux of Alawai Canal. Um, and really, what this big message table, the message from this is that if you look at the right hand side on the big table, there's some color shaded um, column. Um, all the red cells indicates nutrient is being taken up by the system on average, and the green cell is indicating that the system of Alawai Canal is releasing that nutrient. Um, and it shows that the canal has some ability to take up nutrients. Um, it's true for total nitrogen, total phosphorus, nitrate nitride, and phosphate. The only exception is ammonia. And this is quite interesting if you think about redox chemistry and um, the nitrogen cycling processes, because um, when I think about it, ammonia should be produced by biodegradation and could be um, oxidized quickly in the otherwise condition. So this is quite interesting when you look at it. Um, so at the end, um, just conclusion for you to take away in the stream, um, we see high pH, high dissolved oxygen, as well as temperature accompany each other at a very well um, concrete by channelized site. And the nitrogen and phosphorus concentration shows contrasting pattern throughout the watershed. This gives us an idea that uh, there's a spatial gradient in terms of the problems and issues for water quality. And uh, in the canal, we see a salinity driven stratification. And then bringing abandoned excessive freshwater input has the ability to break that stratification. 
in, in the that end canal water, it shows a tendency of lower dissolved oxygen and higher chlorophyll concentration. And when it comes to nutrient flux, the canal shows um, ability, some ability of nutrient retention, but that um, comes with the caveat of uncertainty because that estimation is highly relied on the nutrient concentration estimation in the outflow water. Um, so there you have it, um, that's my presentation. Um, at the end, I wanna thank Dr. Brian Glazer for supporting me throughout my undergrad um, degree. I wouldn't be here without him. And big shout out to Stanley, he works all the black magic. When it comes to my project, I wanna thank Nico, Jessica, and Aka. I wouldn't be able to put this off without them. And then lastly, I want to thank um, All Hands and Smile Away Project. Um, really, I wouldn't be able to put this off. And then I wanna thank our funding source. And then last but not least, I wanna thank my mom and my family. They always have my back. And that's my talk. Thank you. And with that, I can take questions. Good job, Solomon. Um, so we have a first question. I don't know if you can look in the chat window from Dr. Sabine. Okay. Um, okay, so to answer that, um, really that was a mystery for us because that only occurred at one particular site um, along Palogo Stream and it was, the, uh, it was near public housing, it was under a bridge and everything was concrete, um, really surrounded by concrete, really channelized. And to be honest with you, I don't know the exact answer um, of why the pH is so high. Um, it was actually consistently above nine and um, it could be really, um, it could be some sort of point or non-point source pollution that's being, um, that's being um, carried by the water going down, but that um, is again diluted downstream. So I don't know if that's, um, that someone answers the question. And um, it could be, some, yeah, really, uh, my best educated guess is some point or non-point source pollution. Um, okay, Solomon, um, we have a question from um, Dr. Schneider. Mm -hmm. Okay, very nice talk. Um, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first pertains to the salinity at the end of the Alawai, at the uh, land end of the Alawai that has at the bottom, you have higher salinity than in the middle section in your observations. So where's that high salinity water? How is that being replaced? It on what, what conditions? And secondly, you, you uh, hypothesize that under rain events, you increase mixing. Now, just mm -hmm. based on the freshwater flux at the surface, mm -hmm. you would expect a decrease of mixing in the Alawai because of the input of the very buoyant water associated with the rain. Uh, what is the role of wind in, in your mixing? Oh. Okay, um, so to answer that, really, um, there are a few parts to it. Um, firstly, I, I, I wanna make sure I understand uh, your question correctly. The first part of your question is that um, there's higher salinity near the canal head, you say, and then there's, um, comparing to what happens uh, near the canal mouth, is that correct? Yeah, how, how does, where, when does a high salinity water enter the head when there's in your section itself there was a lower salinity in the middle section and then higher salinity mm -hmm. again just based on an objective model it would have expected a continuous gradient from salty at the ocean end to fresher at the uh, at, at the at the head of the mm -hmm. uh, of the canal mm -hmm. so how, how 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 does it work so um i think that is a result from um, tidal influence when you have higher tide and the water was able to make it pass the sediment shoaling after, near the Manoa Palolo drainage. And that slowly pocket was essentially trapped there, um, not being able to make it out uh, of the canal head. Um, so that creates this sort of odd shapes salt wedge in this case. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, very good. How about the second mm -hmm. part, how about the mixing during the rain? So the mixing, um, so from what I read, and um, from what I read, I don't, um, I'm not an expert on this, but from what I read, um, rain and wind can provide the mechanical energy that breaks the stratification and, and enhance mixing. And in our case, it's hard to distinguish the effect 
of those environmental factors um, that's happening um, in the canal. And especially we didn't exactly do a post-storm and pre-storm sampling in our cases. So it's hard to tell um, what the role of each of that um, environmental factor is. But what we do see is that after um, a storm event or after a excessive freshwater discharge into the um, Alawai Canal, we see a enhanced mixing. So that really suggests um, that has something to do with that event. And um, we, we didn't have um, ability to resolve that quantitative, uh, qu quantitatively. But uh, what I can tell you is that because it's hard to distinguish those environmental, environmental factors, um, therefore, this is where we, what we're seeing is a mixed mixture of signal from all those environmental factors. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, great job, Solomon. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker now. So, Zuri okay. Curley will be talking about the environmental drivers of crown of thorns starfish outbreaks in Guam. Zoe? Hello, everyone. Awesome. So, thank you all for coming today. Today, I'm going to be talking about my research thesis titled Investigating Potential Environmental Drivers of Crown of Thorns Starfish Outbreaks on Guam. Uh, my name is Zoe Curley, and my mentor for this project was Dr. James Patemra. And so, to start, we're going to go a little overview. First, we're going to talk about Crown of Thorns Starfish, our area of interest, which is Guam. We're going to go over the main objective and questions, and then talk a little bit about about our hypothesis, um, talk about data used and our approach and our results discussion and conclusion. So the organism of the hour is the crown of thorns starfish. Um, the scientific name is Acanthaster plancy. Um, it's more commonly known as crown of thorns starfish or cots. Um, for the remainder of this presentation, I will be um, using cots just to cut down on a lot of words and speaking. Um, so on the left of your screen, you see what a cot looks like. It is a asteroid echinoderm, pretty spiky. Um, as for reproduction, they're a gonochoristic broadcast spawning species. Um, they have two different types of feeding behaviors, one when they're adults and one when they're juvenile and larvas. Um, for larvae, they consume phytoplankton and adults are coralivores. They prefer to feed on branching and table corals such as Montipora. Um, they are also nocturnal feeders. And the really interesting thing about them is their ecology. So cots are a huge problem. When cots are in low density populations, they're a part of a healthy reef. Um, but when they reach really high densities, they can threaten reefs. They're able to decimate reefs in a matter in just a couple of months, depending on their um, population densities as they consume all the coral. And the real big problem with them is that there's no consensus on what causes outbreaks. Um, other research in different regions, such as the Great Barrier Reef, has um, has been identified and they came to some conclusions, but we're not sure that that applies to different regions. So what the region we're looking at is Guam. And if you're like most people and you have no idea where Guam is, it's right here. It's located between the, it's in the Western Pacific, located between the Philippine Sea and the Pacific Ocean. Here's a satellite view of Guam looking overhead, you can see. It is the largest and southernmost island in the Mariana Archipelago. It has about 168,000 residents. Um, they're, pretty, they're concentrated pretty centrally on the island. Relatively small island, only about 560 square kilometers, um, has a max elevation of only 405 meters, which is seen in Mount Lam Lam on the southwestern portion of the island. One really interesting thing, it has two distinct geological compositions. So the northern end of the island is a flat uplifted limestone plateau, and the southern part of the island is dissected volcanic uplands. And the southern part of the island is the only place where there are streams and rivers. And Guam and the residents of Guam, they're really dependent on reefs. So $450 million of their economy is attributed to reefs. That includes coral reef tourism and coral reef resources, such as the fisheries. Um, a lot of people on Guam do sustenance fishing, so they fish for their families. And in 2017, the GBSP, or the Guam Bureau of Statistic and Plans, published the Guam Crown of Thorns Outbreak Response Plan, which was essentially a framework for how to respond to COTS outbreaks once they have been identified. Within that report, several areas of future research were um, identified, and one of them was that we need further investigation into the spatiotemporal outbreak trends of Crown of Thorns starfish in Guam. 
So the main objective and some questions that this research attempts to answer is, the main objective would be to relate the physical environment to COTS outbreaks to find any evidence that COTS outbreaks are linked to environmental conditions. And some of the questions that came up when, we, when I thought about this question were, where and when have outbreaks occurred in Guam? What are the mean seasonal environmental conditions in Guam upon literature review and investigation? There was, there's no previously existing climatology. So that was something that we had to figure out as well. And then are caught spatio-temporally associated with environmental conditions? So that's like the big main thing we're trying to answer. And in order to do so, we, yeah, in order to do so, we created a hypothesis that we're gonna try and investigate once we figure out these questions. We're, we think that high precipitation and low surf would equal COTS. So the rationale for that, the high precipitation, there's something called the runoff hypothesis, which basically states that when there's more terrestrial runoff, you, there's a higher chance of phytoplankton and algae blooms. Therefore, there's more food for cots, larvae, and corals to eat. And the rationale for the low surf would be cots are unable to remain attached to coral heads. Um, they're a starfish, so they sit on top of the corals as seen in the photo on the first slide, and they consume coral that way. So if there's high waves, they won't be able to stay attached to the corals. And large waves might bury corals in sediments, and therefore that reduces the capacity of, star of the cots to eat their preferred prey. And some data used. So we use the NOAA Mariana Archipelago Reef Assessment and Monitoring Program benthic toad diver surveys. Um, on the right of the screen, you see kind of how these surveys were done. It involves um, towing a scientific diver about 60 meters behind a boat. Um, in these surveys, they take all kinds of benthic data from different, um, different genera, different taxa. They also take um, substrate data as well, but we just use the crown of thorns starfish data from these surveys. We also use three ocean, regional ocean modeling, ocean models. Um, that includes the regional ocean modeling system, simulating waves near shore. And we also used a weather, the weather research and forecast model for Guam. So the approach. First, we were gonna use the NOAA toad diver surveys to map and understand spatial patterns of COTS populations. Then we were gonna utilize the pac ius regional models for Guam to create Guam's first seasonal climatology so we have an idea about the mean environmental conditions. And then we were gonna assess any relationships between seasonal physical parameters and COTS outbreak populations. So once we figure all that out, we were gonna select suitable sites during differing survey years to investigate any site-specific relationships um, about our hypothesis. So we were looking for um, low waves and high precipitation flows. And the results, we're gonna go for the first, talk about the benthic toad diver surveys. We assessed all of the available benthic toad diver surveys. Um, on the right, you see the year and the dates these surveys were done. For the sake of this presentation and the thesis, I'm only gonna show you these two from 2014 and 2017. On the left, you see the 2014 mapped COTS data, and on the right, you see 2017 COTS data. So the smaller the orange circle is, that means there's less, there's lower COTS density. And so the densities of COTS, we calculated them in um, units of organisms per 100 meters squared. So the bigger dots represent, um, there's higher density, so there's more of a chance that there's an outbreak there. The outbreak threshold um, that's used in most literature is 0.15 organisms per um, square meters. Um, yeah, and so what we found from that, that, oops, yeah. So we found that COTS don't show any seasonality and the COTS outbreak severity varies significantly over time at the same sites. The graph you see on the left is um, the island-wide mean densities of COTS um, throughout all MARAMP survey years. So you can see that there was a really tall spike in 2007, had the highest island-wide mean density over the outbreak threshold for the entire island. And then it goes down from there up until 2017. Um, we also figured out that outbreaks are patchy in space. So now we had a little bit of background knowledge on where the cots were and how those populations were changing over time. 
And then we constructed the climatology. The climatology consists of all the variables you see um, listed on the right for the purposes of our hypotheses. We um, mainly looked at precipitation flux and the significant wave heights. So on the left, you see the surface maps of the precipitation flux data around Guam. And on the right, you see the significant wave heights from the SWAN model around Guam. So, yeah. so then we aim to select suitable sites during different survey years to investigate any site-specific relationships. The two survey sites we chose were Urunu Point and Gun Beach. So we found that in, at Arunu Point, they had less cots in 2014 and more cots in 2017. These are relative to each other. Um, Gun Beach was the opposite. There was more cots in 2014 and less cots in 2017. So um, here you see the significant wave heights for 2014 and 2017. You also see the precipitation flux for 2014 and 2017 at Gun Beach. These are week-long periods. And here's a reminder of the COTS. So there was more COTS in 2014 here and less in 2017. And so according to our hypothesis, we would expect that there was lower significant wave heights and higher precipitation flux. But what we actually found was that the waves were inconsistent with our hypothesis. In 2014, um, the significant wave heights were above the um, average for that region according to the climatology. So that was really interesting that we found COTS there. And the precipitation flux was consistent with our hypothesis. 2014 had more cots and had more precipitation. So then we looked at um, Runu Point, which is the same thing, same set of um, graphs you see here. So as a reminder, in 2014, they had less cots. In 2017, they had more. So we expected that 2017, we would see lower significant wave heights and higher precipitation fluxes. So the wave heights were consistent with our hypothesis. There was um, lower significant wave heights throughout the study period in 2017, but the precipitation flux was inconsistent with our hypothesis. And a little bit about the discussion. So in all, we did not find any consistent or significant relationships um, between significant wave heights and precipitation fluxes at our study sites. There's some um, major things to talk about. This study was very limited. Um, we had a lot of data limitations. So we found that Guam is a very data sparse region. Um, it lacks long-term and fine scale environmental data for most of the island. And there was also some data limitations for um, the COTS data we obtained from NOAA. Those surveys were done during the daytime. And as I mentioned earlier, COTS are nocturnal feeders. So when the surveys are done during the daytime, we, don't, we might not be seeing the full amount of COTS at that location. And then our results might be affected by cho the chosen study sites of Gun Beach and Arunu Point. But in conclusion, we were able to show that COTS show no seasonality, the outbreaks are patchy in space, and we created Guam's first seasonal climatology. And going over our last result, again, no consistent or significant spatio-temporal relationships supported our hypothesis. So thank you. That's my presentation. Good job, Zoe. <clears throat> okay, so let's see. Um, if you look in the chat window, another question from Dr. Sabine. Thank you for the question. Um, so the question is, don't waves generally come from the east? So might you have more of a wave effect on the east shore rather than the west side of the island? Yes and no. So we believe that um, some of the things that might be affecting our results would be that our sites do face the same direction of the island. Um, I believe you are correct on the waves generally do come from the east. Um, yeah, so we didn't investigate really like wave direction, but that is something that could definitely be investigated for further, um, further study if that answers. Okay, let's see, any other? Checking to see if anybody's raised their hand. So I have a quick question, Zoe. If you were, um, 
continuing on in GS for another year, what would you what would you tackle with this project? How what would your next step be? Oh boy, do I have a slide for you? <laughs> Yeah, so as I mentioned, we're pretty data limited. So there's a ton of possible future endeavors you can take. Um, we didn't consider the coral community structure. As I said, COTS um, prefer um, table and branching corals. So where we're seeing COTS outbreaks could be, could have to do with like their prey. So if there was more Acropora, there might be more COTS. If there's not as much of their preferred coral prey, that might change where they're going. Um, we could also look at the populations of COTS predators, which are basically giant triton fish, um, humpback wrasse, um, and so we could discover, like, are there high density of predators near COTS outbreak sites, and are predators able to mitigate, if not prevent, outbreaks? And um, we could investigate longer-term environmental trends and try and correlate those in, to COTS populations, and we could... Um, Hopefully, you know, if you got a lot of research money, you could get data on COTS population structure as the NOAA surveys didn't take into account the size of the starfish, just the organism itself. So we would like, it'd be really important to know if we have adult COTS um, or juvenile COTS. So it would be really interesting to investigate those questions. Okay. All right, great job, Zoe. We're gonna move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Diana Lopera, and she's gonna be talking about the effect of uh, the Oa'upua'a restoration on um, Heia Fish Pond. And her mentors are Yoshimi Rii and Margaret McManus. Diana? All righty, let me start this real quick. Okay. Aloha my kaku, my name is Diana Lopera. Today I'm excited to share with you all my GS thesis, which I started in the summer of 2019 as a Noah Holling Scholar. This was made possible under the guidance of Dr. Yoshimi Ri and Dr. Margaret McManus. All right, so before I delve into my research of what I did and how I did it, I first wanted to bring you guys with me, at least virtually, in the place where I had the opportunity to study um, this research. So the place in which this project was conducted plays a significant role in this study, as the underlying driver of this research stems from concerns that were voiced from the local community. So located in the windward side of Oahu is the Heia Ahupua'a, a native Hawaiian land division that stretches from the mountain to the sea. Now, historically, the Heia Ahupua'a was once a thriving functional wetland. Here we have the Ko'ola Mountains bringing down by, fresh water through its many streams, making its way down to the Lo'ikalo and the Mala. The taro patches and gardens, which not only provided sustenance for the people that tended for the land, but also trapped excess nutrients and sediments, allowing for the creation of the local ia, or the native Hawaiian fish pond. This allowed for an immense native food fish community to thrive. However, over the past 100 years, significant changes in how the land was utilized has led us to where we are today, a fish pond that is not as productive as it used to be. And this fish pond will be the focus of today's presentation. Now this fish pond has a name and its name is Loko Ia o Heia or Heia fish pond, which is what I will be referring to moving forward. Heia fish pond is an 800 year old native Hawaiian fish pond and it's this 88 acre body of water is situated where the fresh water from the mountains meets the salt water from the surrounding Kaneohe Bay. Now, like I mentioned, this fish pond once flourished with an immense native food fish community, but now is abundant in non-native and invasive species that do not allow the pond to be as productive as it once was. Now, fortunately, intensive restoration efforts are currently being done and led by the awesome people at Paipai Ohe'ia, who are the caretakers of the fish pond. And now, Heia fish pond is also found within the boundaries of Heia National Estuarine Research Reserve, or Heia NER. So Heia NER is a federal state partnership that um, collaborates with organizations like Paipai Ohe'ia and was established back in 2017. And so, going into my project, Pai Pai Ohe'ia 
actually had a concern and a need to better evaluate the circulation and the water dynamics of the pond. And it was from this, um, this issue that this project stemmed. And so for this study, the main objective um, is to better understand how these ongoing restoration efforts, as well as the removal of these invasive species, which I'll talk about in a bit, affects water circulation within Hei, a fish pond. Now, water circulation is a vital component in the overall health of the pond as it aids in the distribution of nutrients throughout. Also, understanding water circulation is also the first step in helping see improvements in terms of fish pond productivity, which is what we want. And so moving forward, I want to talk first about invasive species. So invasive species is not a new problem here in Hawaii, and Heia is no exception. So one of the better known invasives in Heia is the red mangrove. It was introduced in the early 1900s as a way to combat erosion. However, it quickly dominated the surrounding wetlands, suffocating many of the native species there. It has been and still is a major problem, but fortunately many restoration efforts have been undergoing since the early 2000s. Now, another invasive species I want to mention is the invasive macroalgae population that's not found just within Heia fish pond, but the surrounding Kaneohe Bay. So Gorilla Ogo and spiny algae are known to grow over and suffocate coral reefs, as well as outcompete many native species within the pond. Removal efforts have been ongoing since 2004, and actually an intensive algae removal project just finished in the March of this year, and which I'll be talking a little bit more about in Objective 2. But before going to Objective 2, let's go to Objective 1, which is measuring water circulation flow within Heia fish pond. So how did we do that? So in order to do so, we measured volume flux, the amount of water um, flushing through each makaha, and so makaha is a very important component in native Hawaiian fish pond. It looks like what you see in the bottom left picture over here. And it um, basically controls how much water comes in and out of the pond. And they're strategically placed throughout the fish pond wall with some facing the ocean, some facing freshwater sources. And so at each makaha channel, I deployed water profilers, what it looks like is the bottom right picture. And I deploy them for 24 hours to capture full tidal cycles. And so before I share with you guys the data that I got from these profilers, I just wanted to mention that a similar study was done in 2018 by Mollenkamp that looked at water circulation in the pond in response to major mangrove removal efforts, and particularly this um, removal of this mangrove island that you see over here. So this is an old photo. And so I will be comparing a lot of my results to her findings, but I want to major, I want to note some major changes that took place between our respective studies. So for example, one, there were more intensive mangrove removal efforts, particularly in the upper wetlands. Two, Makaha Nui, as you can see in this picture over here, has been rebuilt today into two separate units rather than one large unit, allowing for more control of water flow. And lastly, a water channel was created in Heia Stream in hopes to divert more fresh water into the pond. All right, so our data. So this is what the data looks like. I'm not gonna go in depth in these particular figures, but in short, what you see here is the water fluxes that are coming in and out of each makaha during a spring flood tide and an ebb tide. So it was from these figures that I derived the water volume flux values that I will be describing in the next couple of slides. And so what we are looking at here in the two figures on the right side are what, how much each makaha is contributing to water exchange relative to the entire pond. So this middle figure shows Mollenkamp's numbers and then on the right shows my numbers. Overall, based on the comparison of these two studies, we see that in my study, there is a more even distribution of water exchange, which is good because this is a sign that there is more efficient water circulation taking place in the pond. So now I want to direct your attention into these boxes, which show the relative water contribution of Makaha Nui. And so Mollenkamp found that at the time of her study, ha over half of the water exchange taking place in Heia Fishman takes place in Makaha Nui. Basically what it's saying is that um, half of the water coming in and out of the pond is happening at this one Makaha. And so if we look at my study, um, 
I mentioned that Nui was rebuilt into two smaller units at the time. And so even with these two units collectively, we see that they only contribute about 25% of um, water exchange, less than half of what it used to. And we also see this redistribution of relative water exchange in the surrounding Makaha as well, such as on top with Kahoola Hui, where it shifted from 13 to 34%, and Hihimanu in the bottom, which used to contribute only 2%, and now is 11% relative water exchange. Now, what we also see is there's more fresh water input at the river Makaha. So this is by one and by two, and these are the Makaha that's connected to the freshwater sources, in this case, Heia stream. And so we see that there is an increase in water come, fresh water coming in. And this is great because when we, really say, when we say fresh water, what we really mean is we see more nutrients coming in, and this could help drive the productivity of the pond. And so I mentioned earlier about this water channel that was created with intentions to direct more fresh water into the pond. Seeing that there's more fresh water coming in, we, this may indicate that this particular restoration effort has been effective in increasing water volume flux um, in terms of fresh water. And so if I had to put all these numbers in a table, this is what it would look like. So what we're looking at is the water flux dynamics of each makaha um, in the pond. And it compares the values that Molenkamp found and the values that I found. But really, I wanted to get your attention to go into this column where it shows volume exchange per tidal cycle. So volume exchange per tidal cycle is basically how much water has gone, gone through the makaha during either a flood tide or ebb tide. And the main takeaway that um, one of the results that we found that was quite surprising is that compared to Mollenkamp study, we found there's about a 40% decrease in the amount of water that is coming in and out of the pond. And so we think that it could be a combination of all the restoration efforts that have been going as well as environmental factors. But we just wanna share this because it was a really interesting find. And so with that being said, let's move over to objective two, which is looking at algae abundance within Hea fish pond. I mentioned they wanted to look how invasive species removal um, affect water circulation. And there was this project from July 2019 to March 2020 where they intensively removed algae within the pond. Now these two maps that you see are um, the two algae that was primarily removed from the pond, spiny algae and gorilla ogo, and how much of it was removed at each removal site. Now, I wanna mention that these sites that were not randomly chosen, they were chosen based on observations made by Pai Pai Ohi'ia, where they observed to have the most algae presence. And so we find that a lot of where their observed algae is along the fish pond wall. Now, actually prior to this project, um, I, I deployed what is called Claude cards which are plaster of Paris blocks that help determine relative water flow. So the idea here was to, the main, the original idea was to deploy these cloud cards before and after algae removal so that I can see if maybe the presence of algae is dis disrupting um, relative water flow. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do the after portion, but this is the pre-algae removal results of my cloud cards. And so this shows the cloud card sites with diffusion factor. And what diffusion factor is, is a proxy for water flow. So basically, the bigger, the higher the diffusion factor, the higher the water flow. And so what we find from our cloud cards when we deploy them before the removal is that areas along the fish pond wall have higher, um, sorry, have lower water flow compared to other sites. And when we look at the uh, maps of where the algae was perceived to be and where the algae was collected, they are in similar areas. So this may be indicative that um, they are disrupt the algae is disrupting water flow, but unfortunately we weren't able to do the after studies. All right, so main takeaways. Overall, it seems the restoration efforts have helped 
um, improve water circulation within the pond. So from the more even distribution that we see throughout each makaha to the more fresh water input that we observed in our river makaha, these um, could be indicative of improvements in the overall dynamics of the pond. Now we also see about a 40% decrease that I mentioned in total water exchange. Now this could be a combination of restoration efforts, environmental factors, but really um, something we wish we did was look into residence times to maybe see if the water is staying longer or whatnot. And so lastly, um, this study is part of a long-term process to reach that one big goal of restoring Heia fish pond to be as productive as it once was. Now, regular monitoring is needed, whether it's water circulation, nutrient availability, microbial activity, to ensure that we continue to understand the state of our pond and what we can do to move forward. And with that, I wanna say mahalo to all these people that have been instrumental in my project. There's so much of them and specifically a shout out to Pai Pai Ohia for allowing me to come to the space and trusting me to answer the questions that you guys had. And with that, mahalo. Any questions? Nice job, Diana. So let's see, we have um, in the chat window, uh, you could see there's a question from uh, Dr. Sabine. Okay, hold on. 11, 11, a.m. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sabine. So the question is, did you account for the fresh water that comes into the back of the pond through the mangrove forest? How has that changed as they remove the mangrove trees? All right. Thank you for your question. Um, so I actually didn't really look into the actual freshwater sources. I just deployed the instruments at the Makaha. And so the data that I worked with was the water that came through um, each Makaha. But we do believe that the restoration efforts have helped um, with whether it's the, the um, making of the water channel or the removal of the mangrove in the upper wetlands could have helped in allowing more wa fresh water to flow into the um, fish pond. I hope that answers your question. I have a question for you, Dan. I think Michael's uh, muted, but maybe he's calling on me. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Jen, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> the the, the Makaha goes, goes up essentially like a guillotine, right, to let the water in and out. And I don't know if you were, um, if you were here earlier, but Solomon gave a really cool talk about the alawai and showed the stratification of salinity and, and fresh water. And, if, if the purpose of the makah is to let fresh water in and out, is, can you think of, a, of, of maybe a new design on this thing such that you let water in at the top as opposed to at the bottom to try and improve this, this mixture of fresh and salt water? Oh, wow. Um, so engineering question. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, Stanley on the uh, line here? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, so like I said, the makaha, its main um, function is to ensure to control how much water comes in and out. And um, your question, I'm sorry, was to how so, to get so, more fresh water in? Yeah, no, so I guess you kind of answered it. I was wondering if it's, if it's really to let more water in and out or if it's to let fresh water versus salt water in and out. So if you want fresh water, you'd open the land side and drain the ocean side kind of thing. I believe, yeah, that's how it should work. Yeah, so it's really to control so that the caretakers of the pond have, um, can control the dynamics and allow for a uh, fish pond to have the environment it needs to be productive. Right, right. And I guess, um, I mean, I've, I've seen these from afar and they look like, um, I, I always naively thought it was to let the fish in and out because it looked like there's gaps in between the yeah, the, one other the function of the makaha is to um, allow um, the smaller fish to be safe in the pond, the fish that we want, as well as to leave the bigger predator fish out 
So yeah, there's different functions as well. So it's not a it's not a solid barrier to water is what I what I meant, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And then I have a I see another question from Dr. Sabine. Is the algae disrupting the water flow, or are they just able to grow better in areas where the flow is naturally lower? Okay, so um, yeah, so the gorilla ogo, they tend to like salt water more. So maybe that's why we tend to see them congregate along the fish pond wall, where it's near the makaha. And so is algae disrupting the water flow? So that's what we wanted to see with the clod cards. However, we didn't, we weren't able to do the after survey. So we can't really say that it's because of the algae presence that there is lower water flow, but the pre-algae removal um, graph does show that there is similarities in areas with lower water flow and algae presence. Diana, there's a, a question from Kong at 11.22. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, Kong. Your question is, are there global factors that could be responsible for the decrease of total water volume exchange? Okay, so he says maybe El Nino, sea level rise. So I guess something, one thing I could say is that it was during the summer, um, there was less rainfall. Um, so that could be um, a factor. However, we don't really, um, we didn't do residence time, which I wish that we did. So that could give us more insight. And so we really think it's the combination of the restoration efforts and particularly the rebuilding, the rebuilding of Makahanui as it was built into two smaller units, controlling, like having, allowing for less water to come in and out. So I don't think it was an El Nino year at that point, but definitely during these times, they would definitely change the amount of water volume exchange throughout the pond as well. Okay. All right, Diana, great job. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to move on uh, to our last speaker, Sean Riston. Sean's going to be talking about trends in coastal ocean conditions on Oahu, and his mentor is Margaret McManus. Sean? Thank you, Michael. All right, can you, everybody. Um, so as Michael said, my name is Sean Riston, and today I'm gonna to be talking about my thesis research titled Trends in Coastal Ocean Conditions on Oahu, Hawaii's Urban Shores. My advisor during this presentation, uh, during the, this thesis research was Dr. Margaret McManus. So Hawaii receives typical trade wind weather from the northeast that regularly brings diverse orographic rainfall to the central parts of the island. Heavy rain brings storm runoff down Hawaii's steep watersheds, and what this does is it elevates the stream flow and brings sediment and freshwater pulses to coastal environments. This in turn affects nearshore water quality. To quantify changes or emergent issues with coastal water quality, it's valuable to characterize waters by observing trends over both short and long-term time frames. The Pacific Island Ocean Observing System, or PACAYUS, collects real-time data on ocean conditions and forecasts future events. Their works aim to promote safe, productive, and resilient coastal areas and address ocean observing needs on both local and regional scales spanning across the U.S. Pacific Islands. The PACAYUS Oahu Nearshore Sensor Group and Water Quality Partnership Program manages nearshore sensor packages deployed throughout the insular Pacific and the Hawaiian Islands including four long-term sensor packages along the south shore of Oahu, across Mamala, and Manalua Bay. This group forms the base of this research. So this, this collaborative effort focuses on water quality parameters gathered as long-term time series data over the course of 12 years. The central goal of this research is to better understand long-term water quality properties along Oahu's south shore, and if trends are found, to establish connections between local trends and long-term environmental processes and patterns, including global climate change. Having been born and raised in Hawaii, I've witnessed physical change in our coast and nearshore waters. This photo is looking out into Monolua Bay, and just to the right is Paika Lagoon, a wildlife sanctuary. Growing up, I've seen this bit of important land begin to disappear year by year, and this has always made me wonder what is happening and to what scale. 
So being a part of the Nearshore Sensor Group and doing this research has allowed me to have a deeper understanding of, of what is driving these changes. So how is this research done? All of our monitoring sites utilize conductivity, temperature, and depth sensors produced by Seabird Electronics. These are also commonly known as CTDs. Each sensor is programmed to take samples and record data on four minute intervals with 10 sample averages. The sample frequency was chosen because it provides a comprehensive data set when accounting for data storage and power limitations of the sensor packages. Site location was chosen based on the highest human density, the amount of activity in each bay, and suitable deployment areas. The type and number of sensors utilized for sampling relates to the funding for the project. Focus began in Waikiki on the Le'ahi side of the Alawai. The Ho'i Yacht Club sensor was deployed in July 2008. The Atlantis submarine dock sensor in front of the Hilton Hawaiian Village was deployed in January 2009. And the Waikiki Aquarium sensor was deployed in September 2009. These three sensors are located throughout Mamala Bay. The Mauna Loa Bay sensor was deployed in, in May 2011. And this is the only sensor located in Mauna Loa Bay, and it sits just outside of Koka Marina in Hawaii. For this presentation, I will showcase data from the Hawaii Yacht Club, the Waikiki Aquarium, and the Mauna Loa Bay sensor. The Hawaii Yacht Club sensor is attached vertically to a floating dock a half meter from the surface. Because of this, the sensor is the only one in the study which does not record pressure. The sensor is capable of measuring temperature, relative fluorescence or chlorophyll, light attenuation or turbidity, and salinity, which is a calculation between water temperature and conductivity. I'd like to point out that this site is in a dredged harbor, so the sensor itself is roughly five to six meters from the seafloor. The Waikiki Aquarium sensor is fixed to an inflow pipe two meters below the surface. This site has the only horizontally placed sensor in this study, and it's capable of measuring temperature, pressure or depth, and salinity. This sensor sits less than a half meter from the seafloor. The Mauna Loa Bay sensor is fixed vertically to a pylon and sits two meters below the surface. This site is capable of measuring temperature, pressure, chlorophyll, turbidity, and salinity. This sensor also sits a half meter from the seafloor. Due to time constraints in this presentation, I'm only going to go over the temperature and salinity from the Hawaii Yacht Club and Mauna Loa Bay, as well as the pressure from the Waikiki Aquarium. For the analysis portion of this research, raw time series data was gathered from both the sensors and the publicly accessible historic data collection on the PACAIS website. All data processing, analysis, and visualization was completed within MATLAB, and parameters were compared to understand trends in water quality on both temporal and spatial scales. Data processing and analysis was condu conducted from spring 2019 to spring 2020. So all of these figures are plotted similarly. The blue dots are representative of our data sets. The red line represents a trend or a change over time. The black line represents a monthly moving average. The x-axis represents time where each tick mark begins on January 1st, and the y-axis shows the given parameter. All the figures in this presentation have significant p-values of less than 0.01 and low r-squared values due to variability. So to begin, we'll look at the temperature at the Hawaii Yacht Club. The first thing I would like to point out is the time frame of, time frame of this plot. Um, so the sensor was deployed in July 2008. However, when the 2011 Tohoku tsunami hit Hawaii, it caused damages to the boat dock, leaving the sensor out of the water for two years. So I decided to do my analysis after the redeployment of the sensor in March 2013. The second thing I'd like to point out are the strong annual cycles. You can see this by going either from peak to peak or trough to trough on the plot. And the third thing are the seasonal cycles. Um, these are visible from peak to trough. Both cycles are distinguishable throughout the course of this data set. Because of its placement at the mouth of the Alawa Canal, the Hawaii Yacht Club is influenced by both solar and tidal forcings, as well as freshwater outflow and this creates a brackish water environment. The, the site shows large drops in temperature throughout the study. All temperature drops are accompanied with low salinity levels, indicating that they are the result of heavy rain events and freshwater outflow. The Hawaii Yacht Club has the highest average temperature among the four sensors at 26.8 degrees Celsius. This may be explained by its position away from open ocean currents, and because it sits closer to the surface than all other sensors, it may also be subject to the effects of direct solar heating of the water. This site sees a change over time of 1.14 degrees Celsius. 
Like the temperature at the Hawaii Yacht Club, Mauna Loa Bay shows strong annual and seasonal cycles. Gaps in this data are from the sensor being sent back to Seabird Electronics for servicing. The Mauna Loa Bay sensor shows the least amount of daily fluctuations. However, it does measure the broadest range of high and low temperature values. This occurrence may largely be due to its geographic location and its distance from the seafloor. Situated near shore between Portlock and Kulio Beach Park, this sensor is in a location with very dynamic coastal circulation, bringing a temperature range from 20.8 to 32.1 degrees Celsius. This range of water temperatures may be the result of tidally driven interactions between deeper, cooler waters from offshore and warmer nearshore waters. Because it sits close to the seafloor, um, this site may also be impacted by submarine groundwater discharge, which can lower temperatures. The combination of these occurrences may be reasoning behind the Mauna Loa Bay sensor having the lowest average temperature in the study at 25.5 degrees Celsius. This site sees a change in temperature over time of 1.21 degrees Celsius. So salinity is a measured, it's measured as a proxy for rainfall events, freshwater plumes and or submarine groundwater discharge being inducted past the instrument. And since all monitoring sites are considered near shore, they are all subject to freshwater input. Because the Hawaii Yacht Club is attached to a floating dock, measurements are always taken from the same depth, making them relatively consistent. This site measured much higher frequency fluctuations than the other three sites due to its placement at the mouth of the Alawa Canal. Since the three streams that make up the Alawa receive large amounts of rainfall, this site receives the most direct freshwater input, greatly influencing daily variability and provides the site's vast salinity range. Salinity measurements at the Hawaii Yacht Club ranged as low as 1.7, the lowest in the study, up to 35.4 practical salinity units, or PSUs, with an average of 33 PSU. The Hawaii Yacht Club sees a change in salinity over time of negative 2.37 PSU. While the Mauna Loa Bay sensor is not in direct contact with a freshwater source, it exhibits the second largest range in salinity frequency from 12.3 to 35.7 PSU. The main cause of this range is from a large rain event affecting the area on March 6, 2012. Although the Hawaii Yacht Club sensor was out of the water during this event, the Atlanta Submarine Dock and Waikiki Aquarium sensors were taking samples and they did not measure such a dramatic decrease in salinity. So this shows that this site might be influenced by an unknown freshwater source or have greater impact from submarine groundwater discharge. Similar to temperature at this site, salinity fluctuations may also be influenced by dynamics of Mauna Loa Bay and tidally driven circulation. And this might explain variability outside of rain events. Mauna Loa Bay has an average salinity level of 34.9 PSU and a change over time of negative 0.73 PSU. While three of the four nearshore sensors are capable of measuring pressure data, the Waikiki Aquarium sensor was the only site that was analyzed. This location has the only mooring which allows for horizontal placement of the sensor, permitting precise redeployment at a specific depth. Daily changes in pressure are dominated by sea level changes due to Hawaii's mixed semi diurnal tides, resulting in two high tides of different heights and two low tides of different heights each day. The pressure data will reflect this frequency change in these tidal intervals. The amount of pressure being exerted on the sensor's pressure gauge is what's used to determine the depth of the reading. The daily pressure at the Waikiki Aquarium fluctuates somewhere between the minimum and maximum values of 1.2 to 2.9 meters with a site average pressure reading of 1.9 meters. Throughout the 12 year measurement history, there is an increasing trend of overall pressure of 0.03 meters. For the purpose of this study, we're assuming that the inflow pipe that the sensor is situated on has been immovable since its initial deployment. Thus, an increase in pressure over time might be caused by some environmental factor like sediment and sand accumulation underneath the sensor from tidal influence, swell activity, and general circulation. All of these trends discussed may also be explained by more complex and large-scale physical phenomenon, such as ENSO and PDO events, eddies, and human-induced climate change. So to reiterate, the purpose of this research was to better understand water quality properties along Oahu's south shore by gathering different water quality parameters as long-term time series data. The central goal, if trends were found, was to establish connections between local trends and long-term environmental processes and patterns, including global climate change. While it may not be included in this presentation, we have done that for all parameters. And to briefly conclude on that, research suggests that we need more time to do such comparisons. Accumulating evidence recommends studies relative to global climate 
measure conditions over a 30 year period or longer. While data for this collection has been measured over 12 years, seemingly short term in comparison to global climate change and other large scale phenomena, our results do tell a story. More than 3.6 million measurements of oceanographic data and the resulting water column properties have been made over the course of this research. The near shore water quality conditions along the south shore of Oahu are changing and we are seeing increasing trends in temperature and pressure and decreasing trends in salinity across all sites. The quantification of these trends in the reference parameters allow insight into the past, present, and future state of Hawaii's coastal conditions. This suggests that further investigation and an extension of the nearshore sensor group would be beneficial in establishing and exploring connections between local trends and long-term global processes and patterns, encouraging action in Hawaii's efforts to adapt plan and implement policies to protect our coastal environment and communities. These long-term trends, these, these long-term nearshore sensor measurements are critical to understanding the changes and trends in our environment. Um, if anyone is interested in the other parameters analyzed throughout this research, please let me know and I'd be happy to send you information. I'd like to personally acknowledge and thank Dr. Margaret McManus for being an, an amazing advisor. Gordon Walker for being a great role model and mentor for me since middle school. Um, Chip, Chip Young and Dr. Chris Abine for their helpful um, suggestions on my thesis report. Dr. Katie Smith, Christina Comfort, and Dr. James Batemra for their programming knowledge. Dr. Brian Powell and Dr. Michael Gidry and Latina Villa for uh, reviewing my presentation. The Velvet Park for paving the way for this project. Han Quach for all her love and support, my GES family. And uh, shout out to Tina for letting me use her GoPro super last minute to get all these photos. Thank you. And with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Um, well done. Uh, let's see. Uh, first question we have um, from uh, Dr. Sabine, one of the most interested in long-term studies, obviously, is uh, if you can see in the chat window, what caused the sustained low salinities at the end of 2015 at the Fiat Harbor? Is there a way that you can share that again? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> right here, this one? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so that's a, the, a good question. So right before 2016, um, I've, I've tried to think about this pretty deeply and I have a feeling it may have been due to the census calibrations and, and maybe needing to be recalibrated. Um, this site in Monolua Bay also does show some decrease along that same time frame, but it's not as deep. So. Um, to answer your question, I don't honestly completely know. Okay, let's go with, uh, so Jim Patemra. Do I need to stop sharing just so I can see the comments? Uh, he's going to come on. He raised okay. it. Then, cool. so. Jim, are you on? Are you muted? Let's try, try to come back to Jim. Um, can't hear him. Uh, let's go with, um, is that Honor? Is that you? Honor's one. Oh, just clapping. Okay, great. All right, let's see. Do we have any other questions? Jim, if you, you were clapping, I guess, yeah, okay. All right, well, fantastic job for all our speakers. If everybody, um, oh, okay, so Jim's question just came in. Um, so looking at the photo, it seems to be a lot of biofouling. Can you say something about the replacement cycle? Yeah. Sure, let me get back to, Sorry, my presentation again. So the replacement cycle as in um, 
what we do to, to get the biofouling out? Well, we, um, we go and service the sensors at a set time between two and three months for every site. Um, and uh, that'll include battery changes and downloading the data just so we have a backup. And if they are significantly biofiled, then we'll take them back to the lab. Um, I'll cut all the taping off, copper tape included, and uh, just redo the sensor, make it look all nice and pretty again. And we'll take it back out. Um, the Hawaii Yacht Club sensor gets biofiled significantly faster than all other sites, um, especially turning spring and summertime. So after, after winter when there's a lot more production. And that one will need to be usually between one and two months instead of two and three months that we'll have to go in and service and clean the sensors. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, that concludes our presentations this year. We will leave the um, chat window open for a little bit. That way all of the uh, speakers can browse through and see if their comments or private comments made to them. But uh, thank you again for everyone for joining us. And uh, we will see you for our next presentations uh, in the fall. Thank you.